Order and the sitting is resumed. It's time for questions to the Minister of Finance and Personnel, and we will start with listed questions. And could I inform uh, members that question six has been withdrawn? I call Ms. Katrina Ryan. Um, question number one, Kesh Diverhain, Lady Hull. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Northern Ireland benefits from a wide range of economic data produced by the Northern Ireland Statistics and Research Agency, the Office for National Statistics, and other. UK government departments such as Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. Virtually all of the economic statistics have been independently assessed and designated as national statistics, and they are therefore fit for purpose. I welcome the views of users to inform the development of our, national st or of our official statistics. However, what the NICFA report fails to recognise is that the quality and timeliness of both economic and fiscal data is as good, if not better, than that of most of the other jurisdictions and regions of the United Kingdom. Continuing to develop our economic and fiscal measures is simply good practice. This is not the same as saying that Northern Ireland does not have adequate economic and fiscal data for our required purposes, and I reject any such views. Katrina, for the supplementary, Katrina Ria. Um, thank you. And the, report, the report clearly shows that the local economy is run on guesswork and the departmental experience rather than measures of economic growth. Um, and justifying it and saying um, it's as good or not better than uh, England, Scotland or Wales I don't think is any justification. I wonder how you propose to address the fact that the local economy is run on guesswork. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I reject it entirely that it is. The yeah, local economy is run on, on guesswork. Um, you know, I, I think we are we're very clear on what our expenditure as a uh, government is in terms of the um, uh, on the other side of, of in terms of our income and our inputs. Uh, there clearly will have to be, given the fact that uh, the HMRC is not set up, uh, Deputy Speaker, to produce regional data. Although we'll have to say it is making uh, good attempts to do so in terms of tax receipts, and that is something that. Uh, staff from NISRA, as long as, along with their uh, Scottish counterparts, are working with the HMRC to ensure that there is uh, uniformity across the United Kingdom in respect of uh, those, the way those um, uh, tax receipts are analysed on a regional basis. Um, there will understandably be estimates where, uh, occasions where estimates are, are used in the circumstances where you do not have the hard and fast data, but that is why I have tasked my officials to work very closely with uh, HMRC, uh, with the Office of National Statistics and with our counterparts in Scotland to um, try to ensure that these figures are as robust as possible in the absence of definitive figures on a regional basis, which is not the way that HMRC is unfortunately set up to produce numbers. Thank you. And I call Mr Ian McRae. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Does the Minister agree that the, the real story behind our economic and fiscal data isn't down to its timeliness? Um, rather than the fact that it illustrates the importance that Northern Ireland remaining membership of the UK? Well, I mean, I think this is, this is the, the sort of the elephant in the room, uh, certainly for Ms. Ryan and her party. You know, I, I think there is, an, there is an attempt, if I was to take a guess, and not that I am, uh, hold myself out as some sort of uh, special analyst of what's in the minds of people in, in Sinn Féin, but you know, I, I would hazard a guess that, um, talking about guesswork, I would hazard a guess that the, there is an attempt here to try to undermine uh, particularly uh, the contribution that is made by the UK Exchequer to Northern Ireland on an annual basis. And, you know, whatever uh, Sinn Féin think the figures might be, there is undoubtedly a deficit between what we raise uh, as a region and what we spend as a region. And as a member will appreciate, we are the net beneficiaries of a very sizable uh, subvention on an annual basis from, from uh, the Exchequer. Um, 2011-2012 net fiscal balance report, for example, shows that Northern Ireland's deficit is 9.6 billion. That is, that is down slightly from the, the previous year's adjusted figure, but it is still a very sizable chunk of money that we receive every single year from Westminster. That accounts for some third, one third, 33.1 per cent of our total gross value added. It is the equivalent of £5,311 per head of this population, compared to a UK average of £2,133. So, you know, whatever way you look at it, whatever you know, Nick say, or whatever Sinn Féin say, or whatever what anybody says, there is a deficit between what we raise in Northern Ireland and what we spend in Northern Ireland. That is an undeniable fact, and the member is absolutely right to say that whatever about the quality or the timeliness of figures as judged by uh, Mr Ruan or Sinn Féin, 
This country, Northern Ireland, benefits considerably from the subvention that we get on an annual basis from the Exchequer. You're going to call him Mr. Patsy McGlone. <laughs> Colonel, I've got a free old ask you on Corley. Um, thank you, <coughs> Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Um, could I ask the Minister, would he accept the, report, the report's recommendation that with the relevant UK agencies, the Executive should provide income output data at a level that allows a more detailed understanding of the import export relationship that exists between the North and uh, GB? Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm not against um, refining and changing the uh, figures and the economic and fiscal data that we produce in Northern Ireland. I, I, mean, I, I have absolutely no qualms about saying that it can always be changed and refined and improved, and that's something that I'm very keen to see happen. In fact, um, in and around the, the date that the NICFA report was, was published, a, a scoping study was published by NISRA, uh, which was um, looking at the feasibility of producing our own sort of national accounts for Northern Ireland, which would sort of ally somewhat with what the, the member is saying, Deputy Speaker. Um, so that's out for some discussion at the minute. We're hoping for a broad range of feedback from everybody from political parties here, the NICVA, to uh, stakeholders in the business uh, community as well, to see whether there is merit in doing that. Um, the merit in doing that will obviously have to be balanced against what, you know, what the, the cost of doing it, whether actually producing the figures has much benefit beyond what we are currently producing, but it's certainly something, Deputy Speaker, that I'm not against doing, something actually that NISRA are actively engaging with uh, stakeholders about as we speak. Thank you. And I call Mr. Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number two. Mr. Deputy Speaker, firstly, the Indirect 5 operational programme has not yet been launched and there are no projects under consideration, so it is, it is difficult somewhat to reduce processing times when there is as yet nothing to process. Uh, that said, uh, using the current assessment process, it is worth noting that the existing Interreg 4A programme has achieved full programme allocation, met all expenditure targets to date, and is on course to meet the objectives outlined in the operational programme. Nonetheless, improvement in the area of application processing is required. Development of the new programmes provides the opportunity to make improvements where possible, and the Department of Finance and Personnel is keen to achieve simplification and efficiencies. For the new Interreg 5A programme, I have tasked my officials to ensure that project applicants experience a streamlined and more efficient process, whilst still ensuring rigorous assessment and adherence with Northern Ireland public expenditure guidance. My department, in conjunction, in conjunction with the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform in the Irish Republic, the Scottish Government and the Special EU Programmes Body, is therefore currently considering a range of options and mechanisms for improving the Interreg 5A assessment process and wider programme administrative issues so that any improvements can be made before the new programme opens for applications which are expected in early 2015. Ongoing discussions on improvements include, for example, the role of government departments, appropriate and proportionate effort in respect of economic appraisals, the means of assessment and a range of administrative improvements. It is important to note that all Northern Ireland EU structural fund monies are subject to the Northern Ireland public expenditure and appraisal rules, and it is right that this remain the case to ensure value for money in what is, after all, public money. Mr McKinney for a supplement. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his reply. Can the Minister assure us then that lessons have been learned around the existing programmes and that, the, that that will smooth the way for future programme applications in relation to SMEs? Again, much like, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, much like the uh, the previous question from his, his party colleague. You know, I, I think there is always scope, no matter what we are doing, to improve what we are doing, and, and to at least, even if there isn't much room for improvement, to look at uh, and assess what we have done for, for lessons to be learned. This is an area where, very clearly, we, we recognise that. Uh, you know, and whilst I think it's worth, it's worth repeating the point that you know, the fund has been, Interreg 4A, has been fully committed, it has met all of its time targets, all of its expenditure targets, uh, and it has done so in spending, it on, spending that money on some very good projects. So you know, we have to, it, it has done its job in that sense, but I would accept that there is, uh, I think, some justification um, for the criticism that perhaps the process of uh, uh, from lodging an application to getting it um, approved has been a slow one in, in some instances. Uh, I'm sure the member would appreciate, as I would, that you know, sometimes it has to be rigorous and robust. Well, it always has to be rigorous and robust, and sometimes it has to be a little bit more so if there is uh, a little bit more work and delving into the scheme that is required. Uh, I'm sure that in wanting to streamline the process and wanting to cut down the time that it takes to, from application to um, uh, a scheme getting passed, 
we wouldn't want to lose any of that rigour or any of that robustness. Mr. Phil Flanagan. I got a free or less control to go and book a session or a suck to a regry. Um, can the minister give us um, an update on any proposals that, that he or his department has to ensure the maximum drawdown of um, interreg funds locally in the future? The, the, the member will. I mean, there, there's a, a, something I, mean, I know there, there have been debates in this House from time to time about drawdown of EU funds, uh, and that is more focused, on, Mr. Deputy Speaker, on uh, you know, competitive funds that are out there where we are competing against. Uh, other regions or indeed other, other member states. Uh, in respect of uh, Interreg funding, uh, Interreg 5A has a, a similar size of funding as the Interreg 4A did. It's around 282 million euros is available to Northern Ireland over the period of the scheme. Uh, it is obviously subject to N, N plus 3 targets. It will be subject to over its lifetime. But in terms of an overall drawdown target, the overall drawdown target is 282 million euros. It is the totality of the scheme that is our drawdown target. And as with Interreg 4A, where we did, and we have been able to draw down all of the funding, or we have been able to commit all of the funding, uh, we would similarly hope that with Interreg 5A, we would be able to, to spend all of the money that has been allocated to Northern Ireland. Thank you. And I call Mr George Robinson. <coughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, can the Minister state of groups and projects currently funded under Peace 3 will be given mainstream funding to enable them to keep going in any delay between Peace 3 and the start of Peace 4? Yeah. Sir, Sir Deputy Speaker, I mean, this, this is an issue that has come up in this House, I think, before. It's an issue that um, some members have corresponded with me about, and I know it's, it's something that has caused some concern um, with some groups that are funded by, by Peace 3. Um, I think the, the point that I would want to make in response to, to, to Mr Robinson is that there is, there is no guarantee that just because a project has got funding under Piece 3 that it will automatically get funding under uh, Piece 4. Obviously, groups who are currently funded under Piece 3 could apply for funding under Group 4 for uh, similar or different work to that which they are doing under, under Piece 3, but they, everybody who applies for funding and receives funding knows that they are getting funded for separate and distinct pro, um, programmes and projects. Uh, so, In that sense, there is actually, whenever Piece 3 ends, so the project also ends, and therefore there is no gap in funding. Whilst there may be a gap between piece three and piece four, there is no actual gap in the funding between them because they are separate and distinct projects. Um, so in that sense, there, I don't think there is any. Uh, there is no need for, say, for example, mainstream funding to be given to um, groups who are performing those functions because they, they should have understood uh, the rules whenever they apply for and receive piece three funding. Thank you, and I call Mr. Tom Elliott. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, so far. Can the Minister uh, give us any indication about economic appraisals? Because it's one of the significant burdens of Interreg 4A is that sometimes a series of economic appraisals were required for a single project. And is there any mechanism to reduce that and ensure that only one economic appraisal will be required for each application? I, I, I don't think. It doesn't matter what type of appraisal it is. I don't think there should be more than is absolutely required. Um, but you know, I, I think the point I would make to the, the member, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is that you know, I think it's, it's critically important that economic appraisals are part of the overall assessment process. Um, not least because at the end of the day, uh, departments in our executive will have to, uh, in many cases, provide. They're, they're the conduit through which uh, European regional de development funding or indeed match funding from own from their own departmental budgets will go to some of the schemes. I think it's absolutely right that departments themselves do do those economic appraisals so that they can ensure, in the first instance, that there is a need for the project that they're being asked to fund, and also that what they are, the quantum of funding that they're being asked for represents good, good value for money. Um, I don't want to see that overly, uh, you know, like I think anybody would agree with this, I don't want to see that done um, to the nth degree where it is over, over and above what needs to be done to ensure that there is need and that there is value for money. Uh, but I do still think that, is, given that it is in the point that I made to Mr McKinney, given that this is public money that we are talking about, and given that it is public money both in terms of the European segment and that it is, it is public money in terms of the Northern Ireland Department's contribution, I think it is important that we do still have that rigour and robustness that comes from economic appraisals as well. Thank you. And I call Mr Alistair Ross. Question number three. Mr Deputy Speaker, the uh, Government will make its decision on whether to devolve responsibility for corporation tax in the autumn, with an announcement to be made no later than the 2004 autumn statement. 
The government has previously indicated that if it did decide to devolve responsibility for the rate of corporation tax, then a standalone bill would be introduced in the normal way, with the aim of it being, becoming law before the prorogation of Parliament prior to the 2015 general election. This is a very tight timescale, and the First Minister and Deputy First Minister have previously highlighted the need for an early decision to the Secretary of State. In the meantime, preparatory work is ongoing in respect of the development of the proposed technical design of a devolved re regime, and Northern Ireland officials are liaising with their Treasury counterparts on that. This will inform the content of the necessary legislation and follows on from the previous work by the Joint Ministerial Working Group on rebalancing the Northern Ireland economy. And uh, I call uh, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, the House will be aware that we are moving closer and closer to September, when not only will find out the result of the Scottish referendum, but also hopefully find out the uh, decision by our national government and whether they will give us the power to lower our rate of corporation tax. The House will be aware that there have been a number of successful job announcements in recent weeks and months, including in my own constituency. But can the Finance Minister uh, advise the House on his assessment of how much of a greater tool it would be if we had a, a lower rate of corporation tax when we go overseas and try to attract foreign direct investment in Northern Ireland? Yeah. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the member, member is right to point out the success that uh, we have had, Northern Ireland has had over the last uh, five to six weeks in attracting around 3,000 new jobs in Northern Ireland with announcements by uh, firms like Ernst & Young, Concentric and Wrightbus yesterday amongst um, a wide range of, of, of firms in Northern Ireland. I think it's some uh, as I say, 3,000 jobs in a very, very short period of time, which shows that Northern Ireland is an incredibly attractive place already for foreign direct investment. Uh, as a member will, will appreciate, I'm sure, the, um, it is the getting Northern Ireland up the value chain in terms of the type of jobs and the quality of jobs that we are attracting, and it is the, the key to uh, success through corporation tax. The uh, Minister of Enterprises Economic Advisory Group, uh, their report suggested some around 58,000 new jobs by 2030 as a result of corporation tax, and there are other estimates, some of them higher even than the 58,000 that the AG pointed out. I think I, I was, my attention was drawn the other day, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to comments by my friend and counterpart, the Irish Finance Minister, Michael Noonan, uh, whenever he was quizzed in, in the Doyle about um, actually increasing their rate of corporation tax. And the member in the House will appreciate that the Irish Government has been under some constant pressure over the last number of years to actually increase the rate of corporation tax. And, and, and Mr Noonan pointed out that, um, based around the argument of the geographical peripherality of Ireland within Europe, which obviously would be similar for Northern Ireland, that a competitive corporation tax rate is a tool to address the economic limitations that come with being a peripheral country, and I agree with him on that. Whenever he was asked uh, further, he said that any increase in the 12.5% rate could unfortunately result in a behavioural change in the part of taxpayers and potentially have a negative impact on economic growth as a result, and he estimated that for every 2.5% increase um, it would result in Ireland's inward investment decreasing by nearly 10 per cent. So I think the corollary of that is, is also true. If we reduce ours down to the similar rate, then we will get similar growth in our economy in Northern Ireland. And I think it's indicative when you look at what the Irish are doing in defending fiercely their 12.5 per cent rate, as um, articulated by Michael Noonan, that it is so important why Northern Ireland also gets the part to reduce to similar levels. Sir Dahi McKay. I a previous concord. Can I thank the Minister for his answer? And can I say, uh, can I hope that he doesn't accept the Treasury's estimates of the cost of corporation tax as readily as he does the deficit figures that were referred to earlier? Um, but can I ask the Minister, I mean, uh, the previous member referred to Scotland, and the experience in Scotland has shown that the block grant offset can be negotiated year on year until a, an accurate final figure can be agreed. Can the Minister update us in terms of uh, the negotiations around the cost of corporation tax over the next number of years uh, after the decision uh, in the autumn. Uh, and also, uh, in reference to Scotland, after Scotland do make a decision, yes or no, in September, how will that influence, in his view, uh, the British Government's final decision on this? Uh, just to, I'm not wishing to sort of go back and fight question one all over again. The figures that I quoted in, in respect of the deficit were, of course, Northern Ireland figures and weren't, weren't Treasury uh, figures. Um, the, look, I, I, I think that we clearly um, the Scottish referendum has had an impact in terms of the, the timing of the decision. I think that's, I think that's regrettable. Um, I think, you know, as, as somebody who wants to see Scotland remain within the United Kingdom, I actually think the Prime Minister could have made a, a very good case by devolving corporation tax to Northern Ireland, that on the basis of a, a very good case being made by Northern Ireland and exceptional circumstances that it showed that devolution within the United Kingdom actually works and could work further 
for Scotland. The Prime Minister chose, chose not to do that. That's his prerogative, um, but he has at least committed to a decision being made in the autumn and no later than the, the autumn statement. It is a very, very, as I alluded to earlier, it is a very, very, very tight window that we have, but I think the very fact that preparatory work is at a, uh, has been ongoing for some time, uh, it has been very extensive and it is a far advanced stage is, I think, some indication that, of the seriousness by which uh, Downing Street, the Treasury and those in positions of power in London are actually taking this. And, and, I, and I think it, it, it does nudge towards um, a more favourable outcome than, than perhaps we might have expected a number of years ago when this campaign was started. I think we have made considerable progress in pushing the case for it. I, mean, I think the argument has been well and truly won over the last number of years. And it is now a matter of waiting and seeing what, uh, what happens in Scotland. In terms of, of, of figures for cost, obviously there's still some, some of that preparatory work is looking at initial cost. And one of the areas of discussion that's still ongoing is the, the uh, formula that is used to adjust the block grant on an ongoing basis. And that's something that is still being discussed between officials in my department and other departments here in Northern Ireland and their counterparts in Treasury. And call Mr. Hogan, McGuinness. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his very interesting answers in relation to this question. I think the Minister is right in relation to Scotland that that is the key issue and that has to be determined, and that's what's delayed this process. But has the Minister uh, discussed any of these matters uh, with Mr. Noonan that he referred to previously uh, in relation to the implications there might be for? both jurisdictions here in terms of jointly attracting investment into Ireland. Mr Noonan and I have, have as you would expect in, a, in our, on our meetings, uh, have discussed the issue of corporation tax. And, um, I was present in, the, in Titanic Belfast when he spoke to the annual CBI launch last autumn. Uh, and I was very, very pleased to hear him at that uh, event, Deputy Speaker, uh, affirm the Irish Government's support for Northern Ireland to have the power to reduce corporation tax. Uh, and I think it might have been, in some ways, might have been easy for the Irish Government, knowing that then that would put us in a much more competitive position against them to, to if not uh, be anti it, to at least take a sort of fairly neutral or, or quiet position on it. And, and I, I welcome the fact that he has been supportive. Of it, but you know, I, I still think that ultimately the decision will be taken in Downing Street and, and, and will be influenced quite considerably by, um, by what goes on in, in the Scottish referendum in, in, in mid-September. Uh, in terms of uh, working with our, our neighbours in the south to attract investment into Ireland, I mean, it's something that has been um, done at a, a UK, Ireland and Northern Ireland wide basis with the recent uh, joint trade mission to uh, Singapore. Uh, you know, I think we've got to, got to accept and got to recognise it, just as we are at the minute, economic competitors with the Irish Republic every bit as much as we are with Scotland and Wales and England and regions within England. That will always remain the case, even if we have the power to reduce corporation tax here in Northern Ireland. But that doesn't stop us on economic development any more than it stops us on tourism or any other areas where there is mutual benefit, there, is, there are mutual interests to be and shared interests uh, for us to work together with our counterparts in the Irish Republic. Thank you. And I call Mr David Hildage. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Question four. Mr. Speaker, I am determined to, uh, that we seek to access all suitable funding sources to maximise infrastructure investment in Northern Ireland. This will not only drive long-term economic growth, but also support our construction sector in the short term. I have become convinced that funding from private sector sources such as the European Investment Bank can play a greater role in supporting infrastructure investment in Northern Ireland. I intend to consider how to maximise private sector funding sources and improve infrastructure delivery here in the coming months. Mr. Hildage for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Principal. I speaking. thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, but what is the Minister doing to improve uh, infrastructure delivery? Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the point that Mr. Hildage raises is, a, is a, a fairly critical point in respect of infrastructure. It's one thing to have increasing amounts of, of capital to spend in Northern Ireland, whether that be um, conventional capital coming through our block grant or raised in the rate, or whether it be accessing private sector sources. It's one thing to have all of that, and we are. The, the, the quantum that we have to spend is increasing. We entered this, enter this year with over a billion pounds to spend uh, for the first time in three years, with um, asset sales and RRI borrowing. It's around about 1.5, 1.6 billion pounds that we'll have to spend this year. Um, so, but it's, it's one thing having all of that if you can't get it actually spent. And I am aware and I accept that there are criticisms that we are not as speedy in getting projects on the ground as, as we should be. Uh, and I have been studying carefully um, very considered contributions by the likes of the CBI, CBI in respect of infrastructure delivery. I've 
uh, looked at best practice and studied best practice around the world, particularly places like Canada and Australia. And I've come to a very clear conclusion when it comes to improving infrastructure delivery. I think there are three things that we need to advance and advance quite urgently in Northern Ireland. First is to uh, better prioritise uh, projects, so to get that pipeline of, of, of infrastructure projects that you hear spoken about quite often. Um, pipeline of projects that are strategically and economically beneficial to Northern Ireland. Second thing I think we need to do is have much better centralisation of both procurement and the actual delivery of projects. I think what we do at the minute is sometimes too disjointed and that's where you get some of the problems. And the third thing is that we need to have a, a, a culture change within procurement and within infrastructure delivery and we need to have um, I was with Cabinet Office a few weeks ago. It was very clear that in the UK, that they are, as UK as a whole, government as a whole, they have gone down the route of getting much more commercial skills embedded within government, so that you are, when you are going in to negotiate and you are going in to discuss the delivery of infrastructure projects with some huge private sector companies, you have people with similar experience to go up against those individuals. And that's something I think has been somewhat lacking and something that I'm keen to see developed and will hope to advance through the work of the Procurement Board subgroup in the next number of weeks. Uh, these are both very good questions and very good answers, but there's a two-minute limit, uh, if I could just remind the Minister, but uh, I wouldn't want to starve the members of the vital information that you're sharing. Ms Michaela Boyle. Gormagot, Dan Lash, Cam Colia, and can I thank the Minister for his extensive answer, and it's gone some way in terms of answering my supplementary, but if I can elaborate, obviously you did talk about the infrastructure deficit, and in terms of my own area, where there is a very, of West Rome, where there is a very high area, uh, or high output of an infrastructure deficit, how does the Minister propose to address these areas? Gormagot. Mr. Deputy Speaker, members are, are, are welcome at any time to come and get a much, even much more extensive answer from me privately, if they, if they, if they so wish. Uh, I'm sure there will not be a list or a long, long queue of people willing to hear that. But look, I, I, I accept, and I mean, this is a, a criticism that it doesn't matter. I was in Fermanagh with the Enterprise Minister last week, and criticism there was similarly, you know, the, the infrastructure investment doesn't seem to make its way much outside of Belfast. Now, I think there's lots of evidence to, to refute that that's the case, that there is uh, uh, investment in infrastructure outside of Belfast. Um, but of course, there will always be uh, demands for more and more and more, and in a, in a sort of limited budget, it's very hard to address all of those, um, all of those uh, demands. Um, I, I think that I, I hope that with a growing capital budget and the potential of avail of new private sector sources of funding through various mechanisms, that we might be able to invest in, in more infrastructure, and that will be spread right across Northern Ireland. Of course, the, the priority in terms of bidding, I, I'm just the guy, I suppose, who handles the money and gives it out to prior, um, projects that are prioritised. It is up to individual ministers, whether that's the roads minister or the housing minister or the health or it, whatever it might be, to uh, come forward with their own priorities. And that's why I think they need to be very clear as ministers as to what the priorities in their, in their departmental areas and then within geographical areas across Northern Ireland are. As was one of the areas we might be able to address in a much more specific um, regional, sub-regional area way is that the local government getting the powers that they are getting through RPA to uh, borrow more money, uh, regeneration powers that they will have, powers of planning, powers of community planning. There is a role for them, and they are not restricted in the same way that we are in, as in central government in accessing, for example, European investment bank funding. There is, I think, an opportunity for them to actually start to take um, a role in driving forward infrastructure investment in a way that in, in the past they haven't been able to. Mr. Danny Kinahan. Thank you very much, um, Vice Principal Speaker. May I thank the Minister for his answer so far? He knows I'm passionate on the subject of getting better leverage out of funding. But is he or has he put in place a structure to make sure that all the different departments who want to lever more funding on the back of their fundings know how to do it, how to do it quickly, so that we actually have that in place, whether it's councils or whether it's other government departments? Yeah, remember is raising an issue which I have identified for some time as a bit of a deficit, um, never mind deficit in funding, but a deficit in actually capacity and knowledge as to what, what is there. And you know, I think we have had uh, for, for some time um, underpinned, I think, by, by less, considerably less capital available to us and therefore a lowering of, of ambitions over the last couple of years. There has been a bit of a black hole, a deficit in terms of the knowledge of funds that are potentially there and what Northern Ireland can do. So one of the things that I've tried to do and tried to drive very personally is to engage um, with local government to ensure that local government um, understands what is there. A conversation has been started with uh, representatives from local government to try to, first instance, to whet their appetite, but also to show them and, and to hold their hand, I suppose, for want of a better phrase, uh, take them through some of the options that are, that are there for them. Uh, and obviously I want to engage as a follow-up from Mr Hildich's question with 
better better mechanisms and delivery mechanisms within central government as well because I think there is still even though you would expect a lot more knowledge I think sometimes there's a, a hesitancy even at central government level to go out and probe the possibilities that there are with different sources of private sector funding. Thank you, Minister. And, uh, that ends the period for oral questions and we will now move on to topical questions and I call Mr Oliver McMullen. Uh, I'm sure the Minister will well, join with me in congratulating everybody who got involved in the Jair d'Italia and made it the success that it was. And uh, that, that involves individuals, councils and community groups. And indeed, in this case here, I would, I'd like to say my own Glens of Antrim, which played a, a big part in that success in day two. And this estate here, Stormont Estate, played a, a big part in it. But, Minister, do we realise that we don't have any cycle paths in this estate? or sufficient cycle provision even for parking. Will you take this into consideration? Well, yeah, uh, uh, let, 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 me, let me first begin by um, echoing what the member has said in terms of the wonderful success of the Giro d'Italia coming to Northern Ireland for the big start for uh, the first three stages. Uh, and as we're speaking, I think the fourth stage is underway in, in, in southern Italy. And I'm sure we've all now got the fever and got the bug and we'll all be going to see who wins the, the fourth stage. Uh, I, I agree with him. I think it was Northern Ireland that showed Northern Ireland at its best. Even if we couldn't, we could arrange everything except the weather, of course. Uh, but it did highlight and showcase Northern Ireland as a great place to come, a great place to visit. The fact that the race went through in the various stages some of our our most fantastic tourism assets, I think, will bode well for, for future visitors coming to Northern Ireland. Uh, I'm very, very pleased that the estate here in, in, in Stormont was able to uh, host a, a, a family fun day. Um, we had estimated between 20 and 25,000 people coming into the estate over the course of the day uh, to watch the race uh, and also to avail of some activities that were put on for them. I'm very glad that so many people were able to come here to Stormont to, to watch the race. Um, I, I understand the point that the member is making in terms of, as, as a minister responsible for the estate, um, I'm very, very keen that well, we would see a lot of cyclists coming in and out of the state anyway. I think, given the fact that it is not public roads, it is a slightly safer environment anyway than perhaps going out onto the Newton Arge Road or other surrounding roads would be. Um, but I'm very, very keen, and I will um, follow on from the, uh, the success of the Giro in the estate and the fact that it is already a successful destination for, for cyclists of, of all ages. Look at the infrastructure, get officials to look at the infrastructure that is contained within the estate with a view to improving it and attracting even more people here. Can I, call Mr. McMullen for the... Can I thank the Minister for that? But, uh, will the Minister agree that, um, that the, the, the Executive is now committed to the legacy of the Giro d'Italia and taking things forward? And now is the time to install more cycle lanes, or, uh, cycle lanes in the estate here, and that would send the message out that we are taking cycling, cycling seriously and not just a, a tokenistic gesture. But I, I, I'm very, very keen to, to capitalise on the success of this year and do whatever I can on the, the fairly limited roads that I'm responsible for as, as Finance Minister. Of course, there are far mo many more roads that are the responsibility of the Regional Development Minister, and I know that he is trying to develop a cycling strategy. And as he develops that, I'd uh, be very keen to, to support that, particularly in terms of investment in better, better and safer infrastructure for cyclists all over Northern Ireland. Thank you. And I call Mr Michael McGimsey. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister that we are now four months away from uh, a vote on Scottish independence, and should that vote go through, and it's, I have to say it's too close to call, what effects does he believe it will have on Northern Ireland's block grant? Has he had any discussions with the Treasury? Is he looking forward to five months hence in that dire situation? Thank you. But, Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I am perhaps a lot more optimistic than, than the, the member um, although I'm sure he, would, he and I would be on the same side of the argument where we in, uh, had the franchise in Scotland. Um, I believe that the Scottish people will, will ultimately see the benefit in remaining part of the Union for a whole host of, of reasons. And the member is right to identify that there, there, will be, there will be issues and ramifications if the vote does not go as far as you know, he and I would be concerned in the right way. You know, I have tried to remain, I remain optimistic as, of the result and therefore don't want to engage at this stage in uh, speculation as to what the consequences for Northern Ireland might be. I think there will be time enough to deal with that whenever the vote happens, just in the same way that the uh, Scottish Nationalist Party don't have a very clear plan uh, for what would happen if they win uh, after uh, the 19th of, I think it's the 19th of, of September. 
We gave Mr. Majimsi for a supplement. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, and uh, thank the Minister for that answer. And yes, we're very much both on the same side of the argument, but it's always preparing for the worst in the health service, preparing for traumas uh, that we hope will never happen, for example, uh, and also in this situation. Uh, uh, the possibility uh, uh, of this going against us. And I'm aware, and, and the Minister is aware, that things like Barnett's consequences, for example, designed, I think, specifically for, with Scotland in mind, with all those Labour MPs, dramatic effects there. So there will be major effects to our finances, and the concern will be a subvention of around £20 million billion is withdrawn from Scotland. Uh, uh, the worry is that the Treasury will look to do something here, and that is the point I was making. Mr. Speaker, I accept the point, I know, I know entirely the point that the member is making, and, and you know, I think, uh, without wishing to sort of surmise, well, I think if, if the vote goes wrong, and I don't want to get into that sort of speculation because I think the, the, the vote will, will go against independence, um, but there has been long uh, a discussion about Barnet. That might be something that might be reignited, to pay, irrespective actually of the outcome in, in September. Um, and you know, I've always been of a view and caution, would caution again members of this House or indeed anybody outside who thinks that opening up a discussion on Barnet would be good for Northern Ireland. You know, I think Barnet has, is far from perfect. It was a temporary measure. It has been in temporary with us now for 40, close to 40 years, but it has served Northern Ireland reasonably well. Uh, and I think that any opening up of Barnet by Treasury would not be done to the advantage of Northern Ireland necessarily. Thank you, Nicole, Mr. Freeman, McCartney. Uh, Gourmet, Gourmet, Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can, can, and I know the Minister earlier in question time talked about the, the 3,000 extra jobs created, and I think that's a very welcome uh, advance. But there, there has been a number of reports about this sort of continuum fall in, in, in sort of living standards and the sort of decrease in disposable income and the, the, the rise in cost of living. Has the Minister any particular proposals, perhaps, how that could be addressed in the future? I, I, I think, I, you know, I accept that whilst we have significant now, significant uh, economic data on a month-by-month, week-by-week basis almost now, which is showing that Northern Ireland is doing much, much better, that we're now not even on the road to recovery, we're now starting to head down the road to recovery, you know, and whether you're looking at um, economic output, whether you're looking at unemployment rate, claimant count, and, you know, things, are, things are right across the board improving. And I think the fact that uh, we have been able to attract in so many jobs over the last number of weeks is, is testimony to the product that Northern Ireland has to offer to, to the world and to investors, no matter where they come from. I have accepted, though, that even though um, there are many good headline economic indicators, that perhaps the last place in which people will see improvement is in their own pockets, in their own household budgets. I think what the executive has done and been mindful of over the last number of years, not even just uh, in the last couple of years, but right back to 2007, is to do, could control as best what it can control, and that is primarily our rates bill. Uh, and we, we are um, the envy of many within the UK as having the lowest household bills in the whole of the United Kingdom. Uh, we have an average rates bill in Northern Ireland of £825 for uh, domestic customers. That's roughly half of what the average household bill, uh, tax bill is for English householders. And of course, we have collectively agreed not to introduce water charges, again, recognising that to do so would hit some of the, the, the hardest hit families in Northern Ireland. Thank you, Mr. Ryan McCartney, for okay. supplement. Uh, Kermit, I'm going to the last one. I'm going to go to the Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for, for that uh, answer? And certainly, I think it's very obvious the impact that rates reduction and water charges has on you no know, people's standard of living. But having said that, would, would the minister, I mean, in light of the decision by Belfast City Council to support the idea of a, of a living wage, is that something which his department perhaps could examine and perhaps recommend uh, as uh, right across the board? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, it was one of it was an issue that I, I did raise with officials not long after after taking up post, uh, and I think there was a, a debate and a discussion in this house at the time about it. Um, uh, the, the issue with um, living wage in, in terms of the, the civil servants that I would be re 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 directly responsible in terms of their pay. Um, the evidence is that there would be very few who would not be on a living wage. Um, that doesn't mean that they're, you know they're made in time if. if uh, uh, opportunities arise, and of course, the member will be well aware that we have a limited budget, and we have tried to, you know, tried to show some pay restraint over the last number of years to sort of fit in with a very tight budget. Um, but you know, the living wage is something which is, which is a concept. It's something that is still developing as an idea over and above the minimum wage, uh, and it's certainly something that I'm, I'm, I'm keen to keep under observation um, as, as time goes on. Okay, Mr. Robin Newton. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, wonder can I ask the, the, the Minister if he could provide the, the Assembly with an update on what work he has been doing on the equal pay claim with the PSNI and the NIO? Okay. In, in terms of equal pay, I mean, the, the member will, will appreciate, because uh, I know he and I have discussed this, this matter before, um, that in terms of equal pay and access to the civil service equal pay settlement, uh, it, was, it was shown in court last year that there was no entitlement for the individuals who were former NIO uh, employees or PSNI employees to access the equal pay settlement. But I have been, um, and again, I, I'm, I've spoken in this House several times about it, and I've committed to myself to looking at the issue and carefully studying the issue as to whether there was, even if there wasn't a legal argument, that there is a moral argument um, that could be addressed in some way. And I can update the. Assembly, Mr. Deputy Speaker, on some recent progress in this matter. I have circulated to executive colleagues a paper in which I have outlined a recommendation which, if it is agreed by the executive, will result, I hope, in a successful and satisfactory resolution of this issue. I call Mr. Newton for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I am pleased to hear, uh, Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, that uh, a paper has gone uh, to executive colleagues, and, and, and that's a piece of good news, a uh, piece of solid work uh, being done. Could I ask the minister when he thinks that a final resolution uh, might be arrived at uh, on the matter? Yeah, well, as, as I pointed out to, to, to the member, without going into the precise details of, of what's in the paper, because the member will appreciate uh, his, from his former time in the executive that it's a matter of confidence between myself and other executive ministers, but the paper has issued. It does require uh, colleagues' agreement in the executive to the recommendation and obviously any expenditure and resources that are required uh, to uh, deal with this issue in regards to, to a payment to the staff who are affected. Um, all I can say, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that I have, as I promised, examined the issue. Uh, I have made a recommendation which is aimed at resolving this issue, and it is now over to my colleagues in the executive to decide whether they want to follow the recommendation that I have put before them. Thank you. And Mr. Pat Sheehan is not in this place. I call Mr. Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister will have noted yesterday the publication of the Ulster Bank Purchasing Managers Index. Um, would he agree that this is yet another sign of economic recovery in Northern Ireland? Yeah, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, I'm following on, I suppose, from uh, some of the comments to, in response to Mr. McCartney. I think that the Ulster Bank Purchasing Managers Index is another one of those indicators which is, is useful in showing where Northern Ireland is headed economically. Uh, it was certainly heralded by, by most commentators. Whenever it was going in the wrong direction, it was held up as very authoritative work. I think it's, it's only right that whenever it's going in the right direction, we equally hold it up as authoritative work. Um, it has shown that the member's right output is up for the tenth month in a row. Um, it has also shown the fastest growth in Northern Ireland since 2002, whenever this report began. It has shown the service sector very much taking the lead, but also sectors that have been hard hit, like construction, also showing work up. And with those new orders going up, employment is also going up, according to the PMI. So again, I do agree with the member that this is yet another sign that economic recovery uh, has arrived in Northern Ireland. Mr Douglas for a supplement. Uh, thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Uh, would the Minister agree that the recent um, raft of economic data uh, and also his uh, the, um, revelation today about uh, 3,000 jobs being created over this past uh, number of weeks, which clearly show that this is a sign that the Executive's economic strategy is indeed working? I, I, I think I've, I've, I've uh articulated this a, hope, a few times previously in this House and elsewhere, that you know, the strategy of the executive of investing very heavily in skills, investing very heavily in, in infrastructure, including, uh, primer, uh, including telecoms infrastructure in particular, um, and also going around the world and selling Northern Ireland as a place for people to invest in, using events like the Giro and other events to uh, showcase Northern Ireland as an attractive place, uh, is starting to work. Uh, and local firms are going out of Northern Ireland, not just seeing Northern Ireland or the island of Ireland or the British Isles as their only available market, but seeing the world and particularly new and growing markets as places to do business. I think it's very important. I think that our strategy is beginning to pay off. It has been, it has been slow, it has been arduous, but it is at last paying off. And that is affirmed too by the Northern Ireland Composite Economic Index, which for quarter four of last year showed annual growth in the economy of some 2.6% with the 
services sector and production sector um, leading the way in terms of growth. Uh, and I think what that shows, Mr Deputy Speaker, again affirmed by the latest Ulster Bank Purchasing Managers Index, is that it is not, at long last it is our private sector that is leading recovery in Northern Ireland. That's what we want to see happening, and that is very good news for, for our people. Order, and uh, that brings an end to our questions to the Minister for Finance.